Hi, and this is the Physics High Podcast. A quick quiz. Do you A, want to be inspired by science communicators? B, want to learn all about science education? C, want guidance on your scientific journey? Well, how about D, all the above? If you have any interest in modern physics, you may be familiar with the Perimeter Institute. Now, the Perimeter Institute, based in Canada, is a non-profit independent scientific organization that seeks to foster the research in modern physics and train up future thinkers in physics. But really important part of their work is educational outreach, seeking to foster a passion for science and raising the scientific literacy of students, educators and the wider community, not only in Canada, but worldwide. Today we're going to meet Dave Fish and he's part of the educational outreach team. And his role is developing programs that seeks to train educators in teaching physics, but also uh, encouraging a passion in science in the students of not only in Canada but also worldwide. Now I had the pleasure of meeting him as he conducted a number of programs at CERN in 2019 and what you'll find is he's a passionate communicator who has a love for science but even more has a love for communicating it. Welcome Dave. Thanks Paul, happy to be here. So I've given my audience a little bit of an intro of what you do but I've only given a very superficial uh, explanation. So tell us a little bit about what you do at Perimeter. Well, what I do, my, my official job title is teacher in residence now. Um, now, that's, it's a job that's evolved over the years. Um, basically, I, I, I would break my, my job right now down into three things. One is I develop classroom resources. So Perimeter, um, one of the things that we're committed to doing is helping teachers bring the, the joy and the, the, the power of physics, particularly physics, but also just science to the classroom. And so as we work with teachers, we've identified that there are certain places in the curriculum where, we, where teachers need more support, where they feel like they need uh, some help. Um, and so we try to develop resources. Um, we have this really cool mix of teachers and researchers. And so our, our resources are... I, we think they're the best in the world because we spend a tremendous amount of time. We have a whole team of teachers who test it in the classroom. They review it. They tell us what works, what doesn't work. We sit down with researchers and the researchers tell us whether the science is right. And, and they, the, not just that, but the researchers help us frame the deeper concepts. So there are things that I taught for 20 years, 25 years. And then I'd sit down with a researcher and they go, yeah, but, you know, it's actually this. And, and in one sentence, they just blow my mind because what they'll do is they'll reframe something that I've understood on a really simple level. But the researchers have spent their lives de diving down deep. And so they've come up with maybe a, a better way, a better synopsis for things or uh, something that has a little more insight. And so part of my job is to bring that into the classroom. So we develop classroom resources. Um, this year, what we're doing is we have, um, we actually have four different resources on the go right now, which is a lot for us. Um, we're working on a resource for optics. Um, a lot of teachers asked us to do something a little more exciting about optics. So we're, we're doing some stuff with optics. We're revising our particle physics unit. So we have a resource that we actually, uh, I spent some time with the people at CERN um, talking through some, some of the deeper concepts in particle physics. So we're just revising that because we released it the year before the Higgs. And so now it's time to come back and say, okay, so they found the Higgs, now what? And so that's, that's where our researchers spend their life, right? We're, my, uh, the people I work with aren't experimentalists, they're theorists. So okay, you found the Higgs, okay, big deal. They don't really, they want to know what's next. They're coming up with the ideas about what's, what, what can we anticipate? And so uh, we're really trying to bring some of that into the classroom. Um, we're working on, uh, we've revised our Planck's constant, which was our very first activity. Actually, the, one of the very first activities we ever brought to CERN as well. Um, and, and it's just a really simple way of measuring Planck's constant using LEDs. And then the final one is this new thing that, um, called a breakout room. So we, we have these activities that you're probably familiar with, escape rooms. Um, there's classroom versions of those, the breakout kits. So we've started making activities for classrooms that are designed around that idea about breakouts. 
And so we have one of those, uh, we actually have two of those on the go this year. So that's one of the, my tasks is, is simply developing classroom resources to help bring authentic um, science into the classroom. The second thing that I do is I do a lot of teacher training. So we run workshops. Um, in the good old days, I would get on a plane and I would go to conferences and I'd go, I'd go to CERN and I'd, I'd meet fascinating teachers and we'd, 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 uh, we'd walk through sort of what are some really good ways to engage students and some authentic ways to assess students. And we've talked through a lot of issues like that. Um, that's kind of gone by. So now that's all Zoom. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop, say, okay, how can we modify our material so that it works in a Zoom conference. Well, that's something that teachers can take then because a lot of teachers are having to work threat by Zoom. And so I have this privilege of uh, having time and, and I have some support where I can then try and develop tools that can be useful for an online environment. So that's one of the things we're working on this year is creating uh, that sort of thing. Um, the third thing that I do that's kind of an interesting, and, and this is the fun one for my everyday world, is our researchers are involved in cutting edge announcements. So one of the things I get to do is help when they have a big announcement is to help prepare materials for communicating that. So uh, two years ago when the EHT released their image, I actually had that image two months before anybody else did. I had the embargoed papers because my job was to develop classroom resources so that the day they announced the discovery, the day they released the image, we had classroom material ready to go. And so this was, this was a, a huge thing for me because I'm actually collaborating with the researchers now. I'm sitting down with these people who have, have made this groundbreaking discovery and I'm, I have to understand it and translate it into a classroom context. And that's, that's probably my, the the part of my job that I love the most, which is the real translation, the bringing uh, cutting edge science down to a, a place where high school students can understand it. And to turn that around and to say to high school students, look, you can understand this stuff. It, you know, the physics that you know in high school is enough that you can understand what's going on. And so that's, a, that's another part of my, my job. Um, the last part of my job is one that I don't do too much of anymore. I played a, a vital role in starting, but we have a, a very substantial um, program that we work directly with students. So we have a summer camp in, 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 um, that we've been running for about 15 years now, I think, um, where we bring students from around the world. We have this incredible two-week immersion experience where um, high-end students just get to go as fast as they want. They get to dig into the topics to the, the level, of, and they've never had this chance. These are the kids who, as a teacher, I meet these kids and you're like, oh, I wish I could spend more time with you, but I've got these other kids that I have to help. And so for the first time in their lives for some of them, um, in fact, one of the very first years we did it, there was a young lady who turned to me and she said, I didn't know there were kids like me. And so for the first time she had peers. And so um, that's always stood, stood with me. I don't spend as much time with that program as I used to. Um, it's up and running and it has its own sort of um, organizational group within Perimeter. And I tend to work more with the teachers and the classroom resource. I'll drop in and, and, uh, and visit and, and be as, as much a part of that as I can. Um, but that's kind of what I do. So my day is mostly spent um, trying to come up with new ways to teach material, trying to, to dig in. I get I get, have the advantage as a teacher. One of the things that I always felt was I never had time to, to really master concepts because I'm always scrambling to get the next lesson ready or to mark yesterday's lesson or whatever. Whereas with this job, I actually, I have the time to watch those in-depth videos, to read the books, to talk to researchers, and it's, it's a phenomenal thing. It's, it's something that, that I'm spoiled. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning of your uh, uh, conversation, you mentioned how you working with researchers, you know, it's like, boom, you even, uh, you know, you had this understanding and all of a sudden 
you're exposed to, whoa, I didn't have that. I've experienced that already just using the resources that you and your team have developed um, and, you know, reading. I mean, I've been educating physics for 25 years now, and I've obviously been introduced into perimeter resources just in the last year or two. And I've read some of those and used some of those in the classroom. And I was like, whoa, there's, that's a, a different slant on that. Um, which, so I get that. And, and for those who are uh, watching the video, I'll put the link to the resources in the, um, in the description. And if you're listening on the podcast, uh, then I'll also put a link on my website. So, so just research, search up Physics High and you're going to find it there. Now, talking about that boom moment, in your work, maybe something recently, particularly when you're talking about those new announcements. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you're exposed to lots of different uh, research that's going on that's cutting edge, but is there anyone that, that stands out that that's really like ignited you? Yeah, the, the, the whole thing with the EHT and that digging into that image, uh, the M87 star image was fantastic. It was a chance for me to be a student again um, and to, to actually try to understand what's going on. And what we, what we find with a lot of material, when, when I started to do research onto sort of why is, it, why is that image, so if everybody's not familiar with it, this is that orange circle, basically, the ring of um, the M87. Oh, you can kind of see it over my shoulder. On, on And, and my can you see it on my T-shirt there as well? I've got it there as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the thing with that is, is why is it brighter on the bottom? Yeah. And, and so... There's so much physics involved in that. And whenever, when I was trying to look into it, I either found a really shallow answer or an answer that was beyond me. That was, you know, like maybe if I was in my fourth year university again and I could remember all that math. Um, but it's, so we try to find that middle ground. So we try to provide that middle ground. So one of my jobs is to sit with the really, you know, the, the people who are completely immersed in it and to say, okay, explain it to me again. And I get to ask those questions. I get to be the dumb guy in the room mm. who asks those questions. And it's so refreshing. Mm. As a physics teacher in, in a high school, you get kind of lazy because you think I'm the smartest guy in this room. Yeah, yeah, some of these students are smarter than me, sure, but I know more because I'm older. Mm. And, and so it's so nice to go into a room and know that okay, I'm I'm the I'm at the beginning of this, mm -hmm. and so I, it's so nice to be able to ask those questions and just keep asking them until I get it. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of times they'll say, oh well, you know this, and they'll throw some general relativity stuff at me, and I'm like, nope, I didn't do that course. <laughs> I was scared, and so the uh, it, it, that's that's the one that I've really probably in the last uh, last year. Um, I haven't had anything in the, in the last little while that I've had a chance to really dig into. Um, I'm hoping to do some new stuff with the EHT. We've got a thing on the, we got a little thing on the back burner right now that's starting to come up. And so um, I'm hoping to dig into that and, and get to know that a bit more again, a different aspect of the MH, MH7 image. You've obviously been involved with science for a long time. Uh, what sparked your interest in science? What what made you go explore science, become a teacher? I'm not really a, 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 a specific moment. Like I'm not somebody who has these, these great events happen. I was always good in math and science. I love problem solving. I love fixing things. I love taking things apart. As a kid, I, I used to, my family would laugh at me because my watch would always be broken. Well, that's because I was always smashing it to find out what was inside. And I was always trying to figure out how things work. And so it was pretty natural for me to go into a science. Um, I did the thing that coming out of high school, I did the thing that everybody says don't do, which is I chose my program based on my highest mark. So my best mark was physics. I was actually going to go into engineering physics at a university nearby. And then a different university offered me a scholarship. So I said, okay, I'll go where the money is. And the coolest part of that was that the program I went into was co-op. So I'm not sure if, if Australia has a big co-op program, but in, in university, you, you, in Canada, University of Waterloo is really big on this. 
you go to you go to school for four months, go to work for four months, go to school for four months, go to work for four months. And so you really get a lot of work experience. And so it gave me a chance to try different kinds of jobs. And one of the jobs I tried was as a teacher or a teaching assistant at a local college. And I had a blast. And, and I just thought, oh, okay. That was the first time it ever kind of occurred to me that I, I might be a teacher um, was that I just went and it didn't feel like work to me. I loved working with the kids. I loved explaining things. I loved trying to, the challenge of trying to help somebody understand something that the textbook explanation wasn't working. And so I, um, I, I think that, that work experience, the funny thing is that work experience, I came back with no money. Uh, <laughs> And, and so in a way, it was, it was not my best work experience because I didn't make enough money to pay my bills. So I actually borrowed some money. But it, it showed me that there was a place where I could go, where I could really enjoy. And so um, I, went back to I went back to university, I finished up my degree, I applied to teacher's college, and uh, I've loved it. I've, I've absolutely loved being a teacher. And then the coolest thing for me was when Perimeter showed up. And, um, and, and, and that gave me a whole new outlet that gave me a whole new connection with physics, um, that I loved when I was in undergrad, I loved my particle physics course. For example, it was probably the most theoretical course I took. And, and that was the one that I, I really, really enjoyed. And so when perimeter showed up and I had an opportunity to work with them, it, it was just perfect. Mm. So you see yourself actually more, if anything, not a scientist, but, but more as a science communicator. Yeah, it's always a tricky thing. Like, can, can a teacher call themselves a physicist? Can, I have a physics degree. I teach physics. Am I a physicist? I don't know. So I like that there's a science communicator category now because I can honestly say, yeah, I'm a science communicator. That's what I am. And... I've always taken it for granted that I was good at this. I just, it was, I, I love teaching. It was something I, I really enjoyed, but with perimeter, I've kind of had a chance to kind of see, no, this is something I'm not just good at. I love doing this. Hmm. I love going places and, and helping people um, really understand a topic in a way that can teach it and make it get people excited about it. And, and I love that. That's, that's what gets me up in the morning now is, is doing that job of saying, okay, how am I going to help teachers from be more effective in the classroom? Mm. And that's, that's really what I see my job as now. Yeah. I, can, I can really relate with you. I mean, I've done a science degree. I've always had an interest in science, but it's the teaching part I enjoy. It's, not, it's explaining it to, in a way that makes someone understand a difficult concept into a more, not simple way, but in a way that they can grasp it. And the joy of going, of, or the joy of the, the kid going, oh, I get it now, that penny drop, you know? I think that often drives why I enjoy communicating science or anything else. So I, I totally get where you're coming from. Can, we're talking about science communication. Um, how do you see your role as a science communicator, not just in the classroom, but as a society in large? I guess where I'm pointing this question is, is that we recognize that scientific literacy is something really important for society. Um, and science communicators really are at the cutting edge of, of raising scientific literacy. Um, how do you see the importance of scientific literacy getting into the community? Oh, I think it's super important. We have, a, we have a society that's driven by technology. We have huge problems that are going to involve technological solutions. And, and we, need, we need just general citizens to be, to be critical thinkers and to be scientifically literate. And that doesn't mean they have to understand the science in, in detail. What they have to understand is how science works. Um, the idea that... that uh, Science is always changing. Science is always improving. Science is always um, tentative in how it answers things. Like I think this whole COVID thing is a really good example of, of how science works. Where as we've learned more, we've changed our instructions about what we should do. And that's good. That's how science works. 
So people are like, well, you know, we, at first you told us not to wear a mask and now you're telling us to wear a mask and now you're telling us to wear two masks. And well, guess what? As we've gone through this, we've done more research, we have more data, we can draw a better conclusion. Yeah. And, and that's strong science. That's not weak. And the idea, like, so we need citizens, just everybody to understand that that's the nature of science. Science is not going to give you the answer. They are going to give you the best answer for today, based on today's work. And, and, and I really think that that's a key thing for us. And, um, and so a big part of my role is, is helping teachers to raise that level of literacy. So one of the things we did is a couple of years ago, we did a climate change resource. And I'm really proud of that resource because we equip teachers with, with fantastic classroom activities that will not just teach the science of climate, but will um, raise the literacy level of their students. Because what we did is we actually, um, we built right into the activities Part of the lesson is how are you being misled or what are the ways that that uh, you are being manipulated? And so built right into the lesson are, are things about scientific literacy. And I, I'm really proud of that. When I do workshop with climate change, the number of teachers who come back to us and they say, I have never had it explained so clearly. And and we're really proud of that because we work really hard to do exactly that, to create that storyline of here's the science, here's the evidence, you know, connect the dots. And so that's a big part of what we do. And that's a, the scientific literacy part is huge, especially in terms of climate change. Mm. There's just so many people who are being misled. Um, and I think it's really important that everybody, not just the scientists, but everybody needs to understand how the science works for the climate stuff. So talking about um, scientific uh, literacy, do you find any pushback? I know across the border on your side of the world, there is a, a huge chasm in terms of, uh, in terms of scientific illiteracy, really. Um, is that the same true in Canada? Or, or are you finding that... Um, your, with students particularly your, um, and the general public, that there is some resistance to the science communication aspect or scientific literacy? Yeah, there is. Um, I've, had, I've had kids, and you, you never know if kids are just being kids and, and having, trying to jerk your chain a little bit. As a teacher, they love to say things that they know will upset you. So I had a, a group of really bright uh, first-year students at, at high school, and we were doing astronomy, and so they, they tried to be flat earth uh, people. And so they're like, oh, and I'm like, okay, that's not even funny. You can't, you can't even, because understand your role here, kids. In this school, kids look up to you as smart kids, and you're talking about this flat earth stuff. What are you thinking? And they're like, oh, okay, maybe it's not so funny. Like they knew that they were joking, and, but it kind of calling them out on it a little bit. But we don't have, I, I'd love to say that we don't have the problem that people south of the border do. It's always easy to point fingers there. Um, but the reality is we have, especially certain regions of Canada where uh, climate science is fought against. We have, a, a, we have one of our provincial governments is spending huge amounts of money to, to debunk climate science. Mm. Um, one of my colleagues, um, she actually, she was, she was one of our reviewers on the climate. Uh, thing and the first time she read it, she gave me huge pushback on all of this. This is crap. This isn't true. Da, 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 you, you can't say that stuff. And I showed her all the evidence. And I showed her all the papers, and she came around to it. And it's like, oh, we've been we've been told this, and then you start to hear that that um, there's there's very well motivated. Um, parties out there who are trying to put misinformation into the school system. Mm. And so that's happening in Canada. It happens in Australia. It happens in the U S mm. uh, you have people and they often have a lot of money because they are in the fossil fuel industry. And, and so they have deep pockets and they will promote, they will 
produce resources that are wrong and they'll make sure they get a good distribution. Mm. And so I, I really feel like um, it, we play a really important role in speaking back to that because we have, we have resources. Like I, I have, uh, I have a, we have budget so we can produce really nice resources. Um, and we have the resource of intellectual capacity. I have researchers who I can call on who are world leading researchers who can answer those questions. Mm. And we make use of that. Mm. I think one of the things I really like about the work that you do in terms of the resources um, is that that whole idea of how science works is embedded it's not just about the photoelectric effect or about general relativity or about how waves, it's about how the process of science. So I think what's really, I think, valuable of what you do at the Perimeter Institute is your training teachers to communicate how science works in the classroom. Okay, if a student forgets, you know, a certain concept, but if you have a student that leaves your classroom but knows how science works, they'll be become much better scientifically literate citizens who will therefore make you know good decisions themselves whether it's in the voting or in their own leadership positions yeah one of our one of our key things that we really try to build into our resources is the idea of, of scientific models mm. um, the idea that science is all about building models and building explanations and the more data you have the better your model will be but that models are always changing always improving and the funny thing is, is with some of our resources, I've had to battle teachers because they don't want to give up their model. So for example, when we do general relativity and I tell them that Newton is wrong about gravity. Mm. Oh, I have battles on my hands sometimes. And, and you, can, you can show people, you can say, here, here's a, here's a way that Newton's gravity fails. And yet uh, they'll hang on to that model because it works for them. And that's fine. It's a good working model for 99% of the things that you're going to need. You don't need general relativity, but you do need to understand that it's a model and that it's not the truth. And I think that's a really important thing that comes out through our resources is, and, and that, that comes from, from history of understanding where people get hung up sometimes as teachers. And one of the things teachers sometimes do is they get hung up on this idea that what I'm teaching you the way it is. Like I've, I've been in conversations with physics teachers. They're worse than any other teacher, I think, for this. Is physics teachers will say, I remember being in a discussion about electric current and whether you should use left-hand rule or right-hand rule. Like which model of current flow should you use? And one teacher is saying, well, I like to teach physics the way it really is. And the funny thing is a researcher at the table looked at him and said, you don't actually think it has anything to do with the electrons in the wire, do you? It's all about fields. And it just shut the teacher down. And the idea that you know, we, we hold on to these, these silly little simple models and, and we don't even know that there's actually much deeper models out there, okay. more correct versions. Okay. Even the, the resource I'm working on right now, uh, the, my next level of, of corrections is I'm talking about the standard model. And so I'm, I'm describing it the way I think of it. And, and the researcher has given me some feedback saying, well, you know, that might have been true 40 years ago. Well, guess what? That's not quite 40. 30 years ago is when I studied particle physics in university. And so he's like, that's not really what we think now. You know, the model has changed. It's grown. Yeah. And so I'm like, ooh, okay. So now it's my turn to grow. It's my turn to have to loosen that grip on that model and, and accept something new. And, and that's, yeah, that's something I love in our resources is that we're constantly, um, we're constantly pushing the boundaries of models. It ties in very much with uh, a recent paper by Jeff Weiner. Uh, and Jeff, of course, you know, who I recently interviewed. And he did, of course, a research as to what was the common model for the atomic structure. And the vast number of teachers were always drawn to the Bohr model or the Rutherford model and, and very scant numbers actually were, act, were talking about models which was, I guess, 
a better model, you know, the wave type of model. And again, that idea of, oh, God, this is the way it is. I still find educators and teachers who are saying, well, that's how it is, the Bohr model or the Rutherford model, when there are so many limitations to those models. Um, and and their technical, the logical the devices rely on a model of the atom that is not the Bohr or the um, <laughs> Rutherford model. Well, really fascinating. One of my favorite things to do with students in, in my senior, I, I, I'm not sure how you break up um, your, your grades, um, but we call it grade 12. So that's your last year. Of, uh, yeah, we have design. And, and um, I love talking to them and saying, okay, remember in grade nine, I taught you about the Bohr Rutherford atom. So I want everybody to draw me a picture of helium. And they can all do that. And I'll say, okay, there's no way that that atom works. And they'll go, what do you mean? I said, you knew in grade nine that I was lying to you. And you were afraid to ask me the question. Because we also teach them in grade nine in the separate unit, though. And this is key, right? And we keep breaking knowledge up into little uh, categories. We would teach them that opposites attract and like repel. And so I'd say, okay, look at that nucleus in the helium atom. you got two positive charges. How can they possibly stay next to each other? And they're like, oh, you're right. And here for three years, they've been holding on to this model that can't possibly work. And yet they won't question their teachers. Mm. And so it's a real, it, to me, that's one of my favorite lessons is in grade 12, I'll say to them, okay, you're old enough now to ask those questions. You're old enough now to challenge me. If I say something to you that you don't like, or that doesn't make sense, challenge me. In grade nine, they're, they're cute kids. They're not going to ask. They're not going to challenge me. I don't expect them to. But by grade 12, I would say to them, I expect you now to take this knowledge as your own. So you have to say, okay, hang on. In chemistry class, we heard this. And in, in physics, you're telling me this. How can those two, what's going on? So I used to have fun with my chemistry teacher. I used to send my kids, you know, a lot of the kids would go from my class to his class. And so for fun at one year, I asked the, I had them ask him what the, the volume of an electron was. Um, and, and so he, as far as in his world, the electron is a real particle, right? Like they're always drawing pictures of the electron moving from one shell to another. So he had never thought about that. And he was so mad. He was like, oh, you hung me out to dry. Like the kids were asking me questions I couldn't answer. But it was a really good chance for him to understand that okay, there's more to the electron than just those little Bohr Rutherford diagrams. And so we, we then grew, we really worked together to build a solid quantum uh, chemistry and quantum physics together. So I would actually lend him some of my material so that he could, he could so I, I'd lend him, for example, my Planck's constant equipment so that when he introduced the idea of transitions, he could actually show the kids with LEDs that the energy levels are connected to the color and stuff like that. So we were able to work together to sort of say, okay, this is all the same science here. It's not, it's not separate science. So we, uh, I really, you know, I, I love doing that kind of thing. We rattle their models. And, and that is one thing that we do. That's a nice little segue. We're talking about year 12 students. What advice or encouragement? Let's say you have a year 12 student who's considering uh, and a career or maybe at least further risk work or further studies in science, what advice would you give them? Uh, the advice I always give my students, I, I used to always give my students the same advice that other teachers did, which is, you know, discover your passion and pursue it. And then I read a book that really challenged that idea. And, and it never did ring true to me because I didn't follow my passion when I was in high school. I, and and I, I read a book that uses a quote from Steve Martin. And it's be so good, they, they can't ignore you. And that became my mantra for about the last five years. Where I'd say to the students, your job, your task is to develop your skill set. Your, your teachers are equipped to assess your tools, to tell you what you're good at. And so your job is to figure out what you're good at 
and then become really good at that. And don't worry about what's your passion or what am I going to do with my life and these big questions. That will come. But you want to be equipped. You want to be ready for when those things do come. And I think that's my lesson is, is you, you, okay, you're interested in science. Great. So head off in that direction. Keep your studies as broad as possible. And pay attention to what you are good at. You will find it much easier to be passionate about something that you're good at than the other way around. You may not necessarily be able to get good at something you're passionate about. And so I think in some ways we flip the priority around. And so one of the things I would say to my students is there are huge opportunities in STEM. Absolutely. Head into the science field. Because even if you decide you don't want to be a scientist, we need lawyers who understand science. We need uh, accountants who understand science. And so even if you end up changing your direction, having a skill set, having some, some basis where you have some science background will never hurt you. It will only uh, improve your, your I, I often talk about a toolbox that, that you want to have as many tools as possible and science will give you those tools. Um, I have three kids of my own who are all university age kids now. And so they're all, none of them have gone into physics. My, my, uh, a lot of my students know my kids because they go to local high schools. And so they are all like, they, they used to kind of make fun of me and say, oh yeah, but your, your, your son's going into computer science. He's not going into physics. And I'm like, well, I was this close to going into computer science. Like my co-op jobs at university were computer science. So it, to me, there's no big deal. But the, what's really key is that they develop some sense of, of how science and math and engineering work. And that gives them the tool set to, to do other things. And, and that's key. So that's, that's my advice to students always is figure out what you're good at. That's your task right now is to figure out what you're good at and get really good at it. And then opportunities will come and you will be ready for them and you will develop those passions along the way. Um, instead of being frozen in place, going, what am I passionate about? What am I passionate about? And, and trying to psych yourself up to, yeah, I really want to do that program. And, and it's, it's fake. What you really want to do is become a, a, a well-rounded, well-equipped human being. And that's, that's always my advice. Very good advice indeed. In fact, I can already think about <laughs> sharing that with my, my students as well. So that's fantastic. Uh, a change of tack here, and I guess a little bit a lighter note. Uh, I'm giving you an opportunity to teach something to our audience, something that you're passionate about, something that, in words of uh, a friend of mine said, that you're nerding about at the moment. If you were in mixed company, it's the first thing that comes to your mind. What would you like to share with us? It's a, that's a hard one. Like, I, I, in some ways, uh, this lockdown has really cramped my style for that. Um, and I feel like in some ways, and I hear this from so many people on social media, that they just don't have that kind of creative bandwidth right now to, to, to do to, to teach something creative. What, one of the things I'm learning these days that I really am enjoying is two of my kids are home from university because of this lockdown stuff. So they're teaching me interesting stuff. And I'm finding this fascinating. Like, um, I, have you guys been, I don't know if you've been following Australia, this whole GameStop thing with the uh, U.S. Yeah. stock market. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my kids participated in that. They were, they were in, they were buying stocks. They were trying to, to, to fight against the hedge funds, basically. And so it's been really interesting for me to learn from them about how this market works because I've never really looked at the stock market. Mm. And so my, my one son is saying, well, okay, but, but basically you've got these hedge funds and they're trying to drive the price down artificially for no reason other than they just want to make money. And, and the, these Reddit users fought back. 
and kept buying it and kept bringing the price back up and and explaining to me what's wrong with the rules and the right. And I've never been interested in stock market, but to listen to my, my kids and have my kids teach me something has been a really neat thing for me. Um, and, and so I've been, I've been learning that uh, for the last, and they're, they're teaching me a bunch of other stuff too, in terms of their, their work and, and what they're, my, my son, my one son is a real avid reader. So he'll recommend books to me. He'll say, Hey dad, you really got to read this book. And, and so that's so cool for me. That's what I'm learning. And that's kind of what I'm nerding out is, is, is that I can learn from my kids. And that's a neat thing is that it gives me, it's giving me a chance to, to, uh, to interact with my kids. This is bonus time, right? These guys are, so my, my kids are supposed to be out of the house and off at university. And so I've got bonus time with them this year. And so I'm learning to, to listen. I'm learning to, to enjoy the wisdom of that they have learned because they're bright and they, they, they're taking courses that I couldn't take that I never, they were never offered when I was in university. And so I love sitting and talking to them and hearing what they're learning about and having them teach me stuff about their world. I, I'm loving that. So it's not really a science lesson, but no, that's but, where I'm at. No, but the teacher becomes the learner. And I think that oh, yeah, yeah. is impo- so important. I mean, it harks right back to the beginning of your conversation. As physics teachers, and, I, and that's what me, I am, is yes, you get so complacent with... I, I'm the expert in the room, as you said, but it's always refreshing. Yeah. In your case, it's you're with your kids, but it's also the remembering that we are still, in many ways, in the big wide universe, we are still kids. We're still l- needing to learn and not to forget the joy of learning as well as the joy of teaching because that keeps us fresh. Yeah, uh, my school board has a, I, I think one time they had a slogan of lifelong learner. Yeah. That that's what they wanted to produce were lifelong learners. And I, I, I really feel like that. That's one of the things I've, oh, I love with my job is that I, I'm a teacher, sure. But in this job, I'm a learner. I, I'm, I'm studying material. I'm actually getting a chance to dig deeper into material so that so I can help other teachers who are in the classroom and don't have the time, don't have the luxury of doing the research. I'm doing it for them. I'm doing the learning. And I love that. And yeah, it's, 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 so that's, that's a big part of, of my life right now that I'm loving is, is just learning from my kids. Um, and, and they've got all sorts of lessons to teach me. And I'm looking forward to, to more. Before we wrap up, I think uh, there's an opportunity maybe to plug the Perimeter Institute because there will be teachers who will be watching this, I assume quite a few. And I really think what you've shared actually is very valuable, not just for students, but actually for, for educators. Um, do you want to just give us a quick lowdown of what the Perimeter Institute can offer teachers? I mean, not only obviously the resources that I've already referred to, but are there also programs available too to attend uh, uh, the Perimeter Institute and so forth? Do you want to give us a little sure. bit of a plug? Um, so one of the things I, I want to mention is all our stuff is free. Um, and, and this is this is... One of the reasons I, it's easy for me to sell this stuff, not only why it, it, is that it's good, but it's free. Um, and, and that's something to, to, to recognize up front. We have programs for teachers. So we run workshops on a regular basis. So um, I just did one last week on Expanding Universe. In uh, two weeks, I think we're doing one on climate change or on quantum mechanics. We're, doing, we're, we're running, because of COVID, um, we are running regular workshops and you can sign in from anywhere in the world. Um, this last workshop I ran, I had people from Nigeria, Netherlands, Brazil, um, Paris, uh, Australia. Mm-hmm. People from around, it's really interesting. It's really fun because I, I, I don't get a chance to see necessarily who's in the chat when I'm busy running the workshop. But um, my colleague who is doing that she'll keep me updated on who's who's who and, and where are these people from and that's so cool so th- that's one opportunity and you can go on our website and, and sign up for these uh these workshops and and it's just done on zoom it's 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 uh fairly straightforward in the summer we usually have a, a, a camp where teachers come for a week or 10 days called einstein plus 
we haven't been, we didn't get to run it last year and we aren't going to be running it this year because of COVID. So what we've done is we have something called the online teacher camp. So you can register for the online, not yet. Registration will open in March for the online teacher camp where for a week, we're going to run a bunch of workshops sort of back to back um, day after day. And, and we'll give you some sort of certification at the end of that week to say you've done so many hours of, of professional development. Um, for students, we have a couple of really neat things. We have ISSYP, which is again, usually is, an in, uh, is, a, is a really neat program for students because what we do is we have 40 students, 20 boys, 20 girls, 20 Canadian, 20 international. And the way we originally set this up was that when they came together, we would have a, a Canadian student with an international student as roommates. So it was this really neat social uh, interaction as well. And so that's part of the nature of it. The, these students get to do a whole bunch of social things. Um, we usually send them to Snow Lab where they get to go down to the dark matter detectors. And, and this is mind blowing for the students because they're, they've never seen an experiment like this. Uh, it's, it, it'd be similar to if you go to CERN, you get to go right down to the detectors. Mm. Um, when I've been at Snow Lab, you know, I've stood on the detectors. I've, I've looked down into the, the, the big vessels. Um, so it's really a neat opportunity for the students. Uh, we have something running in February for the International uh, Day for Women. We have something called Inspiring Young Women in Science. And um, that's, a, that's a neat opportunity that anybody could sign up for. Again, you can register for that. It's free. But you get a chance to interact with some female uh, researchers and ask them questions about what's it like to be a woman in science or what are the challenges or what are the opportunities or what advice do you have? And so it's a really, it's a really powerful day. Again, usually it's a day when people come to us. Uh, this year we're running a, an online version. Um, our website is full of lectures. Every month we run public lectures. That's been a little bit disrupted this year. We've run a number of online lectures this year. But we have everything is available online. So you go to our website and you can dig around a little bit. You can find all these public lectures that were given over the last 20 years now. And some of the, the leading minds of science giving talks to the general public. And so it's very accessible. Um, I used to give it as an assignment to my students that they would, they would actually have to, as one of their communication requirements, they would have to either attend a lecture or watch a lecture online and, and give me some feedback. You know, it wasn't a book report or anything. Like that. It was just a review. Tell me, was it any good? And it was in a way, it was a way for me. I didn't have time to necessarily see all the lectures. So it was a way for me to filter the lectures too, because the kids would come back and say, this one is fantastic. And then I'd go watch that. <laughs> so that's available to anybody. In fact, if you, and if you really want to stretch yourself, if you're a teacher or a student who wants to stretch yourself, a lot of our lectures for our master's students and postdocs and PhDs, and they're all online. Very much like CERN from, from day one, um, Perimeter has, has committed itself to sharing whatever is going on inside our building. Mm. So we have an extensive um, archive of videos now for lectures, classes, things like that. Um, we have a resource center that's got posters it's got resources, it's got posters. Now we have these things called breakout room activities. Um, we've just launched uh, three new Forces of Nature posters. So our Forces of Nature series is um, women in science. So uh, really kind of cool. We, we're, we're trying to just address the fact that, okay, everybody knows who Einstein is. Everybody knows who Dirac is. And, you know, and, and let's give Marie Curie a break as the token woman. Let's, let's, let's say, hey, there are other women who have done phenomenal work. And so our Forces of Nature poster series is, is set up to be that. So you can download them, print them, and put them up in your room. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Dave, for your time. I've, it's been a very in, uh, valuable and really inspirational conversation, actually, especially, I think, not only for students but for teachers as well. And I certainly would be encouraging the teachers to explore the Perimeter Institute in whatever method that you have already raised. So 
Again, thanks for your time. And um, I, I hope we have an opportunity to speak at a later stage. And But by all means, uh, have a look on the Perimeter Institute website and uh, uh, knock yourself out on the fantastic resources that you could be using in your classroom. Thanks again. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to get notifications of up and coming interviews as well as my other physics content. My name is Paul from Physics High. Till next time.